Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, if you're ready, I am ready. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much for giving me your time. I know how valuable your time is. I'll try to be as brief as possible. And um, congratulations. Uh, congratulations for pulling off a hat trick and delivering a sequel in a, of the season, in my opinion, that supersedes its predecessor. Like, I really love this season of Foundation in ways I didn't think it was possible. Like, for me, this is up there with, like, my Game of Thrones and my Mad Men. I'm, I'm just, like, one of those. It's, like, one of the best things to me on television. So thank you for making that for us, and congratulations. Well, that's a that's a nice uh, uh, bit of um, congratulations to hear this morning. Uh, you know, and and it's uh, it's a pleasure to um, to be on your show. Uh, a friend of mine sent me a link to your show. I don't know, maybe five or six weeks ago, and um, it, you know, love your enthusiasm. And I I I we're really happy with the season. Uh, we set out kind of across the board when we finished season one to say, how can we do better? Mm -hmm. How can we, how can we maximize, you know, take the things that are working and maximize that and, and, and adjust, you know, some of the things that aren't. And, you know, with season two, with our returning cast, we knew them. So we were able to write to their strengths. And I saw that Lee was good and a little bit of comedy. So we did more of that. And also there was just, there was some necessary exposition that we had to lay, uh, you know, groundwork for in season one that we had to get through. But it's really gratifying to me that the audience seems to be embracing season two the way that you have. And it's, it's, it's cool. It's fun. So Foundation is a project that I've known to have been in development as, you know, as a project for Phil for years and years. And it was going to be a yeah. battle. Um, can you tell us what the initial reaction was to your pitch and the direction that you chose to take with your adaptation as a TV series? Yeah, so I it had been kicking around ever since I started in the industry. And I had actually, it was offered to me a couple of times to develop as a feature. And I passed on it twice because I just didn't think you could boil it all that uh, into a movie or, or even three movies. And once... Once Game of Thrones came out, it was kind of an aha experience for me because Game of Thrones, I think, really changed the game, no pun intended, with the possibilities for kind of uh, much more novelistic storytelling, you know, and uh, with the admin of streaming and these much more cinematic shows. And so I thought that for the first time, Foundation might be possible, but at the time, I think it was being developed at HBO. And I was working with David Ellison at Skydance and actually James Cameron, we were working on that most recent um, Terminator movie. And David Ellison, who's a big science fiction fan, came in and said, the rights to Foundation are in play. They've, they've lapsed at HBO. Are you interested? And I was like, Ooh, oh my God. Uh, you know, is it a streaming show? Yes, yeah, it's a streaming show. And I remember James Cameron looking at me and saying, Foundation, whoa, that's hard. And thinking... If James Cameron thinks it's it's hard, and David Ellison said, there are 12 different entities and studios that are throwing their hats in the ring, and uh, we got to know by tomorrow, and think about it overnight, and think about, you know, really quickly, what are some of the things that you would do, and then we'll get on the phone with Robin Asimov, Isaac Asimov's daughter, and and do a quick pitch, and, and we did, and we got it. Uh, we beat out all the other suitors, and then suddenly I was... Like, oh crap, now I actually have to do it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I remember saying to my wife at the time, wow, this one's really going to test me. This one's really complicated and hard. And um, at the time, it started developing the series with a guy named Josh Friedman, who was involved in the first couple episodes. And then he ultimately bowed out. Uh, and it has been hard. It's been the hardest thing I've ever worked on in my entire life. And, uh, for all of the reasons that are apparent, but but then it's it's gratifying that like I just feel like we we laid a lot of work in season one, and all of that started to pay off in season two. So I'm I'm really curious, like how do you 
how do you, how do you find your balance? Like, do you have a friend or a muse that you bounce your thoughts off of? Like, how do you find your balance in bringing your own vision and interpretation of the world of foundation while staying true to, you know, Asimov's vision? It's, it's a delicate balance. Um, you know, not all of the writers on the show are really steeped in science fiction by design because we want writers from comedy and from drama because it's it's got to work as a drama it's got to the comedic moments have to work so there are there's really myself and one other writer that are much more steeped in the books but but in between seasons we reread the books again and and we talk about you've got there are two audiences there's the die hard asimov book audience there's a much broader audience of people that have never read the books and are probably never going to read the books and maybe don't even consider themselves fans of science fiction. And we had to, we have to hold both of those in mind. And the other big adaptation element was the original books are so episodic. You know, the first book is just a, an omnibus of short stories. Most of the characters don't continue from one story to the next. And so you, you just have to take what you think are key themes and the key characters and, and, and boil them down and think, you know, how do I expand those while not betraying the, the core elements of those? And so one of the things, and, and Apple and other streamers, they weren't interested in doing an anthology. So in the case of us, I said, well, how do, you know, the empire they exist in the background in the original books, but they're not a huge preven presence after the first short story. And I said, well, that's not going to work. If the whole story is about the Empire falling and what's going to replace it, then we need a face of the Empire to continue throughout the show. And we need a face to continue from century to century. And that led to this aha idea that Josh Friedman and I came up with of what if they're clones? And and it, and again, it comes from the story because the whole idea of of Foundation is that the Empire is resistant to change. They're like freeze; they don't want to let go, and they're brittle. And so we thought, well, what's the purest expression of that? If one guy keeps cloning himself over and over and over again, that's like the ultimate person that doesn't want to change, and like literally. And so what came out of a way of like, well, how do we keep some of the characters continuing? from season to season became a way to express the theme. And then it led to all of these amazing kind of interpersonal dramas between the different clones and them wanting to individuate. So it, it all starts from story. You know, another example was in the books, Harry is just a recording. AI was not a thing that existed in the late forties or early fifties when Asimov was writing. I think if AI had existed back then, he would have had Harry continue on as an AI, but he's not, he's not even interactive. They're just straight recordings when he, when he comes out of the vault. And I said, well, surely he's going to be interactive. And if he's going to be interactive, that means that Harry Selden continues on as character. Uh, and when you have an actor like Jared Harris, you want to keep using Jared Harris. And so then that led to, well, what does that mean to a character if he continues? And what does that mean? to an AI in a way Harry is doing the same thing that Empire is doing which means they're sort of mirrors of one another and so all of these things that were born out of necessity how do we keep some of the same faces you know from season to season led to these really juicy storytelling moments now you you touched on a lot of different things there um, we, we're talking about Jared, we're talking about Harry, but you also talked a little bit about the origin of the Cleons and the genetic dynasty. Can, can you talk about the casting of Lee Pace? Like, what was it that he did in the audition that drove everyone to make, you know, the correct choice in casting him as Brother Day? First of all, he, Lee did not audition. Lee was an offer. Oh, so, okay. We, yeah, we were thinking, Lee and Jared were offers. Everyone's audition. Um... Jared, you know, when we were first writing the season, I I have I do what I call fantasy casting, and I, I put up like a picture of like in in a, my perfect world, 
this is the person that would play Harry Seldon. And I had Jared Harris on the wall in our writer's room in season one. And I think I was watching The Terror season one. Chernobyl hadn't come out yet. And I've, of course, seen him in Mad Men. And I thought, that's that's my North Star for Harry Seldon. So it's amazing that we got him. And you won't believe this, but I had a picture of Lee Pace up for Day as well. Because we wanted, he's like this amazing alpha male. He's 6'5", he's opposing, he's handsome. He, he already looks like a Greek god. He looks like Apollo. Uh, and I thought, he, he just seems like the perfect embodiment of empire and again this never happens but we we went out to both of them they were the first people we went out to for the roles and we got both of them uh and i i, I had been a fan of lee for a long and and i felt like he was an actor that he'd been in pushing daisies and you know he was ronan the accuser but I, I think a lot of people didn't even register that that was him in guardians of the galaxy and he played Forgive me, I can't remember the name of the elf lord in in um, in the Hobbit films. But again, he had a bunch of makeup. I'm not sure people registered that was him. And he'd been a wonderful show that uh, didn't have a large viewership called Hall and Catch Fire. He was like an actor's actor that I knew was really good, but hadn't really choir, no pun intended, like with a mainstream audience. But I knew if he was given the right role, and I felt this was the role... He would just tear things up. And and Lee felt the same thing. He said, I was born to play this role. Uh, and I feel like he was. I love that. I love that. Um, working with such talented people, you know, working with the Jareds, working with Lou, working with Lee. What was your favorite scene to film either this season or last? Um. Well, there's no question one of my favorite scenes to film this season was the scene in episode nine when Selden and Day confront one another, or a different Day confront one another in the vault, because that was something that we'd been building to from the very first episode of season one. And I knew when we sat down to beat out season two that I wanted Day to go to Terminus. I wanted to get Day into the vault and have this match confrontation between the two so that was honestly that was one of the first scenes that we wrote even though it was in episode nine we just knew that we were leading towards that because i had i had always pitched the show to apple as a thousand year chess game between harry selden and an M and the empire mm -hmm. and so believe it or not that scene in episode nine is still only like a third of the way into that chess game there's still many moves uh to come and um, so that was a question, a scene that I really wanted to do. Y you know, the short film in episode nine with Demerzel, where we reveal more of her origin is something that I always wanted to do. And, and Harry's backstory in episode six was something that I'd always wanted to do. And of course, the Sky Bridge fall in season one was something that was massive. And we filmed over months and months and months. There were so, so many different components to that. It just took forever to film. I love your excitement when you're talking about this. And, I, and I've heard you in another interview talking about that exchange with Day and Harry in the ball. Um, I think it was with Pete, Pe Pete Peppers. Um, and, you know, in that scene, I thought it was just very, very, it was, first off, it was just arresting. Like, I just could not turn away. I just enjoyed watching that. But in, in that scene, Harry, um, he offered Day the prime radiant. He offers to teach Demerzel how to read it. Day delivers a line indicating that he doesn't like the idea of AI passing a yeah. computer from one AI to another. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you create that line? Because I'm curious because of, you know, everything that's going on in, um, can, you know, in, in just in the news these days, um, it kind of felt like meta commentary. Can, can you just talk about that line a little bit? Well, the, the sad truth is I don't remember which of us wrote that line because there are there's no question that whoever's name is on the episode usually they wrote the bulk of the line but all of us have our fingerprints on every single episode and sometimes uh will you write a scene or another writer will we write a scene um i think that particular episode was written nine by jane espenson and eric carrasco we we break out the story together as a group 
And then we polish the scripts as a group. We, we room them. We actually go as a group through each script after we've gone through a few drafts line by line and debate, uh, you know, sometimes eight of us, every single line and how can we beat this? And so it's hard to know where the individual's line sometimes came from, but <clears throat> it's as we were writing season two, uh, chat GBT was coming out and mid journey, which is a sort of, um, image sharing, um, uh, AI was coming out. And it was becoming more and more topical and robots were already a thing in the show. So there's no question that, that we added that because it was becoming more relevant and love imitating art. Uh, and that's the thing. Good science fiction works as a metaphor. It shines a mirror back on what's happening today. And so when Asimov was writing in, you know, in the late forties, early fifties, he was writing in a Cold War environment. He was writing about a post-World War II environment. And these anxieties of, uh, you know, Nazi Germany falling and whether or not that would have a resurgence. And so it's always important to look at what are the anxieties that are happening today and see, see how we can touch upon those thematically and update uh, some of the social concerns. And AI, there's no question AI is one of them and became only more relevant as we were writing the show. Okay. Um, thank you for that answer. I was very curious about that. Um, just, just thinking about the scenes of this season, you know, there's so many powerful scenes. Um, can you, can you describe a scene that was difficult for you or the cast or the production to fill and why? I mean, one of the most difficult scenes to film was the execution and potential execution and then rescue of Constant in episode eight. We filmed that uh, in the Canary Islands in Tenerife, and it was actually right by the ocean. So at the edge of the banister where it seems like we're a thousand feet up, the surf is right there. So everything beyond that banister is CG. And we had to, it was um, in this plot inside an opera house uh it was incredibly hot it, it was you know 90 95 degrees over the course of four or five days that we were filming so much was going on we had a lot of extras we had stunts we were it had to be really careful with our stunts because it's a like a national landmark uh and it just it was enormously enormously complicated i think we spent four full days rehearsing that sequence we were at that opera house for about two weeks and we staged it like a war everything was storyboarded everything was pre -vis. and you have so many characters that you have to check in with at that scene and th that was just phenomenally complicated the other one that was really complicated was all the stuff in the first episode with harry inside the prime radiant we had four different sets some of them had mirrors and we had to digitally erase the crew in the reflections. Some of the sets uh, tilted and, you know, uh, Harris was actually um, in a safety harness. And so the inverted and went upside down. And that was just really a mind bender to figure out how to shoot all of those. Uh, that's the thing is there, there are very few just simple scenes in a show like this. And then... The sequences in The Beggars for episodes two or three that I directed on Uda's World and then The Escape from Synac, that was really complicated that we were on a set at Gimbal back and forth and then we had a an LED wall outside with waves and then we built an exterior section of The Beggars Lament out in a parking lot and shot at night and we had rain cannons going and all sorts of... Uh, that was incredibly complicated as well. Uh, that was a real slog. Is telling Bond the mule? I can't answer that. <laughs> she, it certainly seems like she's dead. I don't. I. I think that. I think that's been ruled out. <laughs> I had to ask. Um, Salvor Hardin. Now, Salvor Hardin's um, apparent death at the end of season two. That was a surprising twist. Like, I don't think many people are going to see that coming. So. Yeah. Out of her death, we see a strengthened bond and emotional interdependence between Gail and Harry. 
Um, can we expect to see more of this dynamic of Harry and Gale bonded together uh, as a family by the way of Salvor and, and Raish in, in season three? Yeah, that was part of the goal um, with Harry's character this season was to dimensionalize him, to take him down from this pedestal and get his feet dirty and get him emotional and learn about his interior life and, and also repair the relationship between him and Gail. She's kind of one of the only people probably in the galaxy that really understands him and vice versa. So... He plays such an amazing character in season one, but he's very aloof and and you don't get much of a glimpse of his interior life or his feelings. And so that was something we were really going for this season. And that's Salver's sacrifice. Look, we knew we'd faked out the audience a bit in terms of Harry's death. Uh, but we also knew and we also knew that the fans would assume Salver in particular had flawed armor because he's supposed to die in the future that that would happen and look i adore leah harvey as a person i adore salver as a character it just felt like it was the right thing to do for the story you know her sacrifice means that the future isn't written in stone and that humanity can survive that even though the odds are really long and even though it looks like the mule is going to upset everything that there's a chance and I think that's what's exciting for me when I watch the show, if I don't know what's going to happen. And sometimes that means you have to say goodbye to characters that you love. I adore Belle and Hober. Uh, I didn't want to say goodbye to them either, but it felt right for the story. You have to break some hearts. Uh, and, you know, I, I think 9 was a shocking episode, but in its own way, 10 was maybe more shocking given how many deaths ended up happening with main characters in 10. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I really love the concept of uh, Calais. Calais, the uh, mathematician in the Prime Raid in season two. And, and also, real quick, I love the diversity. I don't know if you're getting the, that acknowledgement and appreciation enough, so I just need to say this. Thank you. I, you know, I never knew as a kid how much it affected me as a person until I got older and I began seeing more and more positive representation on TV and Foundation has it. It's it's absolutely. Thank you. Um, but that I, means. Well, no, th thank you for saying that. That means a lot to me. And it was. It was a very intentional choice when I started developing the show is I was aware of the fact, particularly in science fiction and in fantasy, that it's, you know, tends to be dominated by white men. Not always, but um, less so by, with, you know, uh, people of color. And um, I just thought we had a really special opportunity here. And so diversity has been, it's, it's best actor wins, but we... We cast a wide net. I mean, we had casting directors in India. We had casting directors in Japan, casting directors in Africa. Uh, you know, we have our main casting directors. We'll, we probably have at least half a dozen different casting directors around the world. And I'm just constantly saying, bring us people we haven't seen before. And, and you know, in almost every case, it doesn't matter if they're male or female or, or you know, what their heritage is. But... Um, Look, thanks for saying that. That's that means a lot to me. Thank you. Um, that being said, will we see more of Calais in season three? Yes. Now, Callie made Harry human, right? In this season, we also see Harry and Gail acknowledge each other as family by way of Raish and his daughter Salvor. Harry refers to Salvor as his granddaughter. Are those two things related? Like, was it because Harry became human that he was able to acknowledge and develop these ideas and feelings towards Salvor and Gale? I think so. It, it, that was... There's an exchange between Salvor and Harry. Look, he, he, he always had feelings. I mean, we see that in episode six in his backstory. But I think once he lost Yana and his unborn child, I think he bottled off that side of him. And he just said, I don't want to go there anymore. I think he went 
Raish, but with everyone else, he just didn't want to open up his heart. And he wanted to hide behind the, his math. And you said as a justification for everything. He, I think it was just too emotionally painful for him. And I think now that that opened up something inside of him. And Selver says there's this whole they debate you know, why well, you had immortality. Someone put you back in a mortal body again. Why would they do that? Uh, and Selver says I think when we wanted you to have skin in the game. And I will say, without revealing too much, there is something to that. There is Selver. Selver was on to something. And so the question is, who and why would they want Harry Human again? And and not just flesh and blood in terms of the fact that he's vulnerable, but human in terms of him being connected to his emotions. Now I, I know your time is valuable. I'm gonna I'm gonna start to wrap up. What is Brother Constance's name? Or at least is there a chance for us to find out? Oh, man, no. Yes. Oh, never, Perfect. never gonna, I'm never gonna reveal her real name. I know some people were disappointed by that, but I think, I think it's fun. You get, we're never gonna know. Okay. Now I, I do have a couple of uh, questions from the fans. I'm gonna try sure. to shoot these at you rapid fire. Go for it. Go for it. Um, Will we see more murals from the Mural of Souls in future episodes? We, yes, without question. Okay. Um, Demerzel tells Helena that she also doesn't have an individuated existence. Is that statement related to her programming and duties to Empire, or is it a remnant of the robotic civilization, meaning like the multiple lives she's lived in the past? Sorry, some that's, that's kind of no, it's okay. That's kind of verging into spoiler territory. The intention is we will be exploring all of that a lot uh, in season three and what it means when she says her, her consciousness is distributed and we will be exploring a bit more of her past and her internal life in season three. That's certainly the intention. And we haven't we haven't said goodbye to Luminism either. That's uh, something that's going to uh, circle back into the show uh, next next season. Um, are the Cleons bisexual? Yeah, I think they're pansexual. I think I think they, they don't care. I mean, that was I mean they're monsters, but they definitely don't care who you love or who you have sex with. Um. Next question: When when can we when can we expect to learn how was Gail able to stay awake during an interstellar jump in that first episode? Is it soon? We'll we'll start to answer some of that uh, in season three. Yes, I mean there were definitely things that we have not answered yet, like who brought down the star bridge, and, and just because we haven't answered it doesn't mean we're not going to. It just means that we decided that that. We haven't hit the optimal time to reveal that. So yes, we we will reveal both of those things. Um, next fan question. Um, this one, you let me know if you can answer it. D uh, they, they, someone is putting together maybe a connection. Uh, does the Demerzel has this? Does Demerzel have the same chip as Heli from Severance? <laughs> <laughs> no, no connect. We wrote, I love Severance, but we wrote season two long before, uh, we were almost filming season, I almost finished filming season two when Severance came out. I think we were in the last month of season two. So it was purely a coincidence. Is Talon Bond the mule? Talon Bond, uh, Talon Bond is not the mule. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, here's a question for me. And I, this is just for me because I'm just fascinated with 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 you honestly in your career and i've been following a lot of your work as a film critic for over a decade now mm -hmm. who is the unsung hero of your career wow the unsung hero i mean probably my first mentor who was a screenwriter named nelson getting um I was his teaching assistant when I was at USC Film School. Nelson was an old school screenwriter. Uh, he'd served in World War II. He got shot shot down in World War II and was a prisoner of war. Uh, Nazis, he was Jewish. And he wrote a lot of movies for Robert Weiss. He wrote The Andromeda Strain. He wrote the original Haunting. 
And he taught me a lot about writing and the craft of writing, but he also taught me a lot about becoming a man and becoming a human being. And he really encouraged me. He said, the problem with a lot of writers is they don't have a lot of lived experiences. And Nelson had lived all over the world. And he said, you really got to get out. You really got to travel. And I went to Tibet because of Nelson. And I went to Africa and I went to Thailand and Vietnam and all these crazy places. I've, I've probably been to at least 60 or 70 countries in the world now and had a lot of great experiences. And and you never know when those things will funnel their way back into your writing. And so he's definitely would be the unsung hero. And then, of course, my wife, who puts up with all the craziness. She travels the world with me, and she's the secret sauce for sure. Uh, I mean, every other week, I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know if I could keep going. And she's like, you can keep going. You can handle this. Yeah, that's the correct answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got my wedding ring on. Um, I learned that you have a few plans to wrap up foundation foundation based on how many seasons get approved. Um, what can fans do to make sure you get what you need besides just telling all our friends to watch? Like, does our social media reaction work? Do we yeah, buy all, all of the above, all of the above, uh, social media, uh, the biggest thing, you know, writing Apple for, for, without question, emailing Apple. The big thing though, is simply telling fans especially as we go into the holidays you know a lot of people catch up on new shows over thanksgiving and christmas because they they meet with friends and family and they say what's what's the big show that i should be getting into just spreading the word i mean the show's doing really well the, the audience is really built but just you know you know uh convert people you know to spread the word uh the church of galactic spirit <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I created the hashtag foundation. I'm hoping to try to build on that and get something consistent that everybody could look at. Um, Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Again, I know you're very busy. I really appreciate you giving me your time to talk about this wonderful show. I'm looking forward to season three. Um, thank you again so much. Thank you so much, David Goyer. Thank you. And uh, I, I appreciate your show and, and your analysis. It's super fun and it's it's fun to do stuff like that. So keep keep doing what you do. Thank you. Hope to speak to you again in the future. Have a great one. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.